Hello, my name is Chan Mei I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist from KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. I'm also an adjunct associate professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. So the next ethical issue I'd like to talk about now is decision making in ethical in palliative care. Respect for persons requires medical staff to ensure that any decision or choice made by a patient is fully informed, made freely and voluntarily without coercion or undue influence. Some people might say that during palliative care, it is difficult to fulfill all these criteria of the informed consent process because the patient being seriously or terminally ill may feel depressed, desperate, scared, or influenced by well-meaning loved ones or even medical staff themselves. Perhaps bringing the decision earlier upstream before any crisis occurring or having discussions around advanced directives would help patients think about these issues and about their goals and wishes in life instead of forcing them to think about it when crisis happens. In a sense, some people feel that decision-making in palliative care really should be no different to that in general medical care. Although, like I said, some are of the opinion that the informed consent taken in a palliative scenario may have validity issues. The situation is further complicated when there's conflict about the medical care of persons who do not have decisional capacity and therefore need to have surrogate decision makers for their medical care. So these scenarios include a person who has lost decisional capacity either permanently or temporarily, a person who has never had or will never have decisional capacity, for example, uh, a child who is born with uh, mental uh, um, um, deficiencies, or a person who has not yet developed decisional capacity but will develop decisional, com uh, decisional capacity with time. So first of all, it is important to know what is permitted in uh, the country you are in. So you should know the law of your land. And that sometimes uh, will determine who can be surrogate decision makers for these patients. There are also certain uh, hierarchy of su uh, surrogates uh, that is permitted by law. For example, uh, a child, usually the surrogate decision maker are the parents. For uh, adults, older adults, often the, de the surrogate decision maker is either the spouse or if there isn't a spouse, then there is a hierarchy of what family members can be appropriate surrogate decision makers. Whatever it is, what is important is that we should try and get as many relevant voices in the decision as possible. The most important, of course, is if you can get the, the actual patient's voice uh, itself, uh, whether it is through writing, for example, an advanced directive, or whether it was verbally communicated with loved ones, for example, through con conversations or, or remarks in passing. However, obviously, in cases like children who have never um, um, attained decisional capacity, that is not possible. In which case, then the surrogate decision maker will be the one that's, that would be important to help to make decisions. But their decision is not absolute either. The healthcare professional should also uh, help to make decisions because the healthcare professional can give the um, case of the medical uh, uh, need for treatment. Finally, court, the court can make a decision for a patient in cases where there is intractable conflict between either the surrogates and the healthcare professional or amongst the family uh, members themselves. However, the court is really not um, a good place uh, to make decisions because ultimately what we really want is a shared collaborative decision making between people who care for the, the patient uh, as well as medical uh, healthcare professionals.